Before I begin today, I want to personally thank uh, City Year uh, Chicago, a local organization that enables, again, young people to volunteer and truly make a difference in our schools and our community. City Year Corps members have provided millions of hours of service across our city, tutoring, mentoring nearly 10,000 children in our most challenged schools. You heard earlier t uh, this, uh, this afternoon, serving as role models in all our communities, and they do serve as role models. They demonstrate that young people have the power to improve our city and change the world, and truly, they inspire all of us. I want to thank all the City Year's Board of Directors and leaders for their hard work and dedication, and all the young people throughout the city who dedicate themselves to positive pursuits. I'm humbled to stand before you once again to report on the state of our great city. It's an understatement to say that we live in a very complex and difficult times. Far too many people in Chicago and across our nation continue to feel the pain of the nation's worst recession in 70 years. People are struggling to get by. Even though the statistics show that violence on our Chicago streets is far less than a decade ago, unfortunately, it continues leaving pain and suffering in its wake. Revenues for most cities and states are slow or declining. Businesses have been tentative in hiring new employees, if they're hiring at all. This recession has made it clear that the world's economy is more interconnected than ever. An economic slowdown in one part of the world can have global repercussions. Even though these challenges are great, I know we can overcome them. And that every Chicago, and especially those who are forced to put their dreams on hold because of the recession, can again realize their dreams for the future. The, the hurt and even anger that people still feel today have only deepened my determination to help Chicago work better for everyone. That commitment is seen in our long-term efforts to transform our economy, turn around our schools, control costs and spending in government, and take many steps that are fundamental to a better quality of life and the creation of economic opportunities across our city. It's due to the hard work of thousands of citizens, community people, religious, political, foundations, and business leaders that were living in a stronger city today with stronger neighborhoods. But that's not enough. There is more to be achieved. We, may, we face major challenges which together we can all solve. It sometimes gets overlooked, but when I became mayor, many of our neighborhoods haven't experienced major investments in years. It's because together we had the foresight to invest in new schools, police and fire stations, parks, green space, housing, libraries, senior centers, along the streets, alleys, sidewalks, water mains, bridges, medians, that our neighborhoods are stronger today. Without these neighborhood improvements in Chicago, we'd be far behind. Without the foundation of creating new opportunities as we emerge from this deep recession. Years ago, we understood the necessity of turning around our public school system that had failed students and taxpayers for decades. As a city, we knew that a good education is a pathway out of poverty and a great equalizer in our society. As a result, many schools are improving. This year, overall test scores are up both at the elementary and high school levels. The dropout rate is falling. More and more of our students are graduating, going to college, or getting a job. A diploma means something. It's not just a piece of paper. And there is greater accountability throughout the system. Our students have already made lasting progress for which they deserve our praise. So do our teachers, our principals and parents, and the business leaders who could contribute so much to the success every day. In the last decade, the city of Chicago has invested about $5 billion on capital improvements alone. Our schools aren't yet where they need to be, but I am convinced that all of us put our children first. Then Chicago's schools can become the best in America. At the same time, we made our economy more diverse and stronger, even as we strengthen core sectors such as manufacturing. Through investments such as tax increment financing, we have created and retained thousands of new jobs all across Chicago including struggling communities. 
Chicago is more competitive nationally in a global economy today than ever. We become a city where more business want to locate and create jobs. In fact, during the worst of the recession, almost 100 businesses expanded or located downtown in our neighborhoods, creating more jobs. Miller's Core, Ford, Willis, Serious Materials, Shop and Save Market are among them. We've also acted aggressively since 2003 to protect our homeowners from foreclosure. We've helped build thousands of affordable housing units. We have been strategic in using TIF funds in order to leverage other funds for supporting affordable housing, and we will continue to do so. We led the way in transforming public housing so that the residents there can have a better chance at success in life. We protected our environment with groundbreaking programs that have improved our quality of life and saved tax dollars. During good times and bad, we've done more with less in city government. Remember, more with less in city government. We've cut spending by over $2.6 billion and implemented management improvements, including best practices, yes, from the private sector. In fact, Crane Chicago Business recently reported that the city of Chicago spending increased by only 19 percent between 1989 and 2008, while city government nationally increased an average of 58 percent. We protected our property taxpayers by limiting property tax increases and raising them at the last resort. I want to thank uh, all those who, who signed a property tax relief bill who worked so hard that reenacts the tax cap on property values for another three years. We've also taken many steps to prevent corruption and wrongdoing by implementing fundamental reforms in areas such as hiring and the way contractors do business with the city. I've appointed an independent inspector general, giving that office more authority. We often work proactively with them to uncover and punish misconduct. In general, we have made government more transparent accountable and accessible. That includes reinventing the city's website to provide more information about contracts, spending, services, and the operation of city government. Stepping back has everything we've tried to accomplish gone perfectly. Of course not, but Chicago's made much progress. We're better off as many people acknowledge. I've always been willing to admit when we need to do better, and then we've done it but I never coast on the past accomplishments because I know there is always more to be done to improve the lives of every Chicagoan. And that's why today I want to address the most immediate and pressing problem we face as a city, violence in our streets, in our homes, in our communities. As a father and grandfather, I share in the pain of those who have lost loved ones and friends to violence. And like every Chicagoan, I am not satisfied that the numbers show that homicides today are far fewer than a decade ago. Numbers don't provide much consolidation if you lost a family member or a friend to violence or feel vulnerable to an awful grip in a community or family. But as reasonable people understand, making Chicago safer does not have one answer. It has many. I truly believe that with strong policing, greater citizens' involvement, parents, churches, block club leaders, strong gun laws, and better coordination at the local, state, and federal levels that we can turn the tide of violence, not only in our city, but throughout our country. And towards that end, yesterday I announced many new steps we are taking. Among them, I have challenged Superintendent Weiss to review his strategies to ensure we're doing all we can. Obviously, good policing is essential. We're putting more officers on street duty, collecting more guns. Since 2006, our gun turn-in and seizures by the Chicago Police Department of Guns have collected almost 23,000 illegal guns here in the city. At my direction, the department has trans transferred 268 officers from behind desks to street patrol in the last year and retrained them for their new duties. As I've announced in next year's budget, Despite our financial challenges, we will fund the hiring of 100 new police officers to patrol our communities. This is essential and is a priority. Over the short term, the police department will accelerate the use of $9 million in economic stimulus money to pay for overtime 
so we can put more police on street duty during peak hours of violence. Early this summer, the department created a 100-person strategic response team that is being deployed to the most violent areas of the city. At the same time, we are working even more closely with all law enforcement officials to better use of unique tools, including the RICO laws, to hit gang and drug pins where it hurts, in their pocketbooks. Yesterday, I met with Sheriff Tom Dart, State's Attorney Anita Alvarez, and members of the Chicago Police Department in the court system of Cook County to make sure we have a coordinated and united front in the fight against violence, and we do. Through the state's gun trafficking task force, we are redoubling our efforts to fight gun trafficking that brings illegal guns to our streets. We're working hard in Washington, D.C. to end the gun show loophole and reinstate the national ban on assault weapons. And we will work to enact stronger gun laws in Springfield. There is no substitute for, for strong gun laws that keep weapons out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them in the first place. That was the idea behind the new gun law we recently proposed and that the City Council enacted after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against our existing ordinance. I understand that some Chicagoans want handguns in their homes for their self-defense. I've listened to them. So our new ordinance allows responsible adults to keep handguns in their home. But we will continue to march in all of our communities against crime. Now, after every march, we'll give marching orders to the many citizens who march with me, who want to help, but just don't know how to do it. We'll coordinate, continue to challenge more people to come forward, to end the code of silence against your family, your child, your church, and your community. I understand that fear is often a factor, but there are many ways to report crime anonymously, including through the faith-based community our police department, Texas, and phone tip lines. In some cases, victims would rather carry out their own street justice, which only perpetuates crime. And to protect our children, we would continue to fund after-school programs, provide security, to do our best to keep them safe as they go to and from school. We need more of our parents to accept their responsibility and abide by the city's curfew in their homes and in their community. And we must keep all of our children out of harm's way. In so many cases, innocent bystanders would not become victims if they weren't standing idly at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Soon, I will convene a group of judicial leaders to help us craft new laws, ways to keep criminals off streets and ex-offenders from returning to the criminal system. Safe streets are essential to a good quality of life in a stronger city. So in a growing economy that creates new jobs and opportunities all across our city. And that's why today, I also want to look to the future, offer my view about how Chicago can emerge stronger than from the recession and become a better place for every Chicagoan to live. A better future won't happen by chance. We must act proactively, which we're doing, to transform Chicago's economy create new jobs and new businesses throughout the city. We must get back, get people back to work now and over the long term. The good news is that even though the recession forced many businesses to cut jobs, some are being created, but very, very few, I'd be frank. By no means have we or any major city achieved the sustained job growth we need because of this deep recession. The bad news is that we have to assume that any recovery will continue to be slow or slower, as will private sector job creation and any sustained growth in the city revenues. And that's our recent steps are so important. I want to thank thousands of Chicagoans in our community who supported bringing Walmart to Chicago. I want to thank the members of the City Council and thank the unions for listening and hearing the voices of people who want jobs who wanted the store for their own communities. And this was a people's reaction from the community from the west and the south side. The, agree the recent agreement... <laughs> the recent agreement between Walmart and cooperation 
Yes, with the city council, community, and labor unions have set a stage for a strong long-term relationship with Walmart in neighborhoods all across Chicago, just like the suburban areas. In just the last few weeks, we have approved new Walmarts in Chatham and Pullman communities. The company's long-range plans for Chicago stores will create thousands of temporary construction jobs, add thousands of permanent jobs, and generate $500 million in additional tax revenues for the city. And the Walmart North Avenue store has already generated $4 million in sales tax revenue for the city since it operated in 2006. And just last week, we took another big step forward on a project that will create jobs, opportunities, and whole new neighborhoods on the southeast side of our city. We introduced an ordinance that authorizes the expenditure of TIF funds for phase one of the plan to redevelop the northern portion of former U.S. Steel South Works at 79th and South Shore Drive. This project will return a long vacant piece of property to the tax rolls. The first phase will provide more than 840,000 square feet of retail and commercial space, almost 1,000 units of rental and for sale housing. Importantly, it will create 1,500 temporary construction jobs and nearly 1,000 permanent jobs for the South the east side of the city. And just last week, we saw Chicago's manufacturing future with the opening of the new assembly line for the Ford Explorer at Ford Motor Company's south side plant, which will add 1,200 jobs and strengthen Chicago's manufacturing base. The fundamentals of Chicago's economy, which we put in place long before the national recession began, have helped us get through these tough economic times. Without our un unique location as a nation's transportation hub, our diverse economy, excellent transportation systems, strong neighborhoods, and educated workforce, our economy would have taken an even deeper hit during the recession. There are core strengths, and we have worked hard to maintain and build and rebuild on them during these tough economic times. And President Obama's economic stimulus program has helped us weather the storm. I want to thank him and Congress for their support. Moving forward, we will continue to capitalize on our location and the sheer size of our city in our market, as well as new immigrants and the growing number of young people as among our major economic str strengths. But we almost also must bring the jobs of future to Chicago to further diversify our economy and greater opportunity. In recent years, we have worked especially hard to target emerging business sectors we believe would increasingly become the foundation of Chicago's 21st century economy. They include technology, clean energy, healthcare, financial services, hospitality, biosciences, innovation, transportation, and of course, manufacturing and small businesses. We have already achieved some success in expanding these sectors. Now, we must keep them growing and make sure Chicago's workforce is prepared at, at all skill levels to be hired for the jobs they provide. We want Chicago to be a city of opportunity, of good paying, skilled jobs for everyone. Success won't happen in six months or a year. In America and in Chicago, we must take a long-term view, like China does. When they look 20, 20 or 25 years down the road in planning their economy, in making major investments to support their jobs and their growth. We must understand that in the 21st century, our competitors for new jobs are not New York or Los Angeles, or places like Shanghai, Singapore, Mumbai. The fast-growing technology field will continue the basis for our long-term economic growth and job creation. Chicago has already attracted a number of leading technology manufacturers, as Google and Navtech. Cultivating this growing field is essential if we are to be more competitive as a city. Similarly, we demand for clean, clean energy has grown. Chicago and the region have stepped up. We are already home to 14 major wind companies and the nation's largest urban solar farm working with Exelon. As a marketplace continues to demand cleaner technology, Chicago's green reputation has helped position us to further expand our leadership in this area. Chicago has already has thriving healthcare and biotech sectors, 
supported by world-class hospitals and universities, many of which are pioneering breakthrough advances. Prospects for job growth in these and related fields, like nanotechnology, are as strong as the global demand for modern healthcare solutions will increase. At the same time, Chicago is consistently ranked as one of the world's top global financial centers. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is one of the top three exchanges in the world. Chicago is a global leader in the growing financial trading industry. Chicago's strength in this field bodes well for economic future. And hospitality remains another growth sector. Even in the middle of the recession, in 2008, over 45 million domestic and overseas visitors came to Chicago, contributing more than $11.8 billion to our economy. Projections show that Chicago, with its growing list of hotels, restaurants, leading cultural and tourist attractions, continue to be a leading destination for domestic and global travelers. And Chicago has consistently been a global leader in manufacturing. Manufacturing makes up more than 10% of our local economy and employs over 470,000 workers. Today's manufacturers increasingly fall into categories of advanced manufacturing, which means that the work that once required manual labor or assembly lines is now being performed through automation and technology with advanced careers in both fields. Maintaining a growing and vibrant manufacturing sector and their supply chains is essential. We don't want these jobs to be sent overseas. We want to create and keep them right here in Chicago. Next is our small business, especially in our communities, have been and will continue to be the cornerstone of our Chicago's economy. 90% of businesses in Chicago are small businesses, and the vast majority of local jobs are provided by them. Small businesses are part of lifeblood of our city's neighborhoods, and we must continue to support them and their job growth, and we will. Finally, we will continue to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's why we support visionaries like Chicago-based Coupon, one of the fast-growing technology companies in the country that can identify opportunities, take risks to develop new processes, design new products, and open new markets. Continue to build a modern and diverse economy that provides 21st century jobs across Chicago won't be easy, but is essential. And we'll find as much as we can to keep our efforts going here in the city. And towards that goal, we are focusing our resources and executing a comprehensive long-term strategy that touches every aspect of government, from new business creation, recruitment to strengthening education, jobs training, to ongoing neighborhood and infrastructure improvements to support those who need it the most. Our plan won't work unless it works for everyone, unless it strengthens every part of our city, and it does. Working with the business community, we are creating a major new public-private partnership to be funded by the private sector. My goal is to bring 21st century jobs to Chicago to support ongoing job growth by helping retain and expand businesses for the future that are already in Chicago. Through the partnership which we are calling Chicago's Growth Accelerator, we will keep Chicago's among the top global business destinations in the future. The Accelerator Initiative will enable us to target high growth business sectors, become a national leader in research and development investments, and attract and keep the best talent. We'll also use this fund to step our efforts to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. To encourage the growth of small business across Chicago, we will create a new city-based loan fund. This in addition to the fund now operated through the city treasurer's office to help small businesses stay afloat and expand. We know that there's a high demand for small business loans, but in these tough economic times, Traditional lenders are not adequately serving the market, especially for women and many times minority firms. Given the importance of neighborhood small businesses to our economic prosperity, I've been invited two successful small business people to join us today. They both received assistance through the City's Small Business Solution Station, a program designed to provide entrepreneurs with free one-on-one -on -one business counseling. They reflect what can be accomplished by our city's entrepreneurs 
when they work with the city to get their business off the ground or grow them. This program has helped us tremendously. Gulia Isamalvo obtained a 5,000 small business loan, which helped open a dog grooming business. She used the money to purchase equipment and inventory to get her business opening. She also took advantage of the city's free business education workshops to help her start the business and prepare for the inspection. And on Wednesday, July 7th, she officially opened the doors to Vertsec Grooming, Daycare, and more located on North Ashland Avenue. Now that's a success. Mariso Nieves obtained a small business loan to build out a new daycare facility to replace one that burned down. Soon she'll be back in business with the help of the city loan. will open the, her facility to take care of five-year-olds. Her business will create nine new jobs. Now they are Chicago's great success stories. They deserve our praise. They're here today. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. We'll continue to find new ways to make it easier to set up and operate business large and small. And we want to make it less cumbersome, the city does, to get permits, license inspections, to take other steps that are essential for business growth. Government should not stand in the way of business growth. We will, st we will stay the course with our recent successful efforts to reinvent and grow Chicago's convention and tourism industry. We all know that for Chicago to have a strong economic future where every person can succeed, our workforce must be educated and skilled. Training our residents is remarkable skills for modern jobs and the most important ways we can support the people of Chicago in the years ahead. Towards that goal, we are transforming education at every level from our public schools to our workforce training programs at City College of Chicago, so we can better coordinate all of our job training and education efforts. We must maintain our commitment to make Chicago's public schools the finest and the best in the nation. We must graduate far more high school students who are prepared for college or a job. Then we can graduate more college students so they can be ready for jobs. And we must keep these talented graduates in Chicago. Central to our plan is the opening of the fall first 30 of 80 career academies, which are designed to offer job skills to those students who want to graduate from high school, ready to go into job market and be more focused on higher education. And that is essential. Our partner has to be the business community in these career academies. Ultimately, we expect over 23,000 students to attend these schools to be trained in a wide range of skills, culinary arts, information technology, to health sciences. But there is more to be done if we are to better, better educate our students. Reading scores must improve at both the elementary and high school levels. And we must lower the dropout rate. We must improve more of our neighborhood schools. We must turn around our troubled high schools. And we must continue our efforts to teach more foreign languages in our schools give more of our students an opportunity to pursue careers in math, science, and technology. If we are to build a better educated, more skilled workforce, we must also realize the full potential of our city college system. So we are reinventing it from the ground up. The reality is that the skyrocketing cost of traditional college education has put four-year colleges and universities out of the reach for many, many students throughout our country. Our city colleges are often the only option for those who want to be trained in the skills of tomorrow or prepare to them to move on to a four-year college. Under our city's college new president, Cheryl Hyman, we are rethinking the aspect of classroom learning to ensure we're providing a quality education to those students who seek it with the modern skills training that others want. We also want to provide a clear path to their careers so that city colleges, students graduate, they must meet employer requirements and are able to get a job. At the same time, we must also better train our adults 
from those who have lost their jobs and need to be trained with modern skills to those who need to improve their skills. We have already recruited the first class of 175 adults under our groundbreaking Chicago Career Tech pilot program under the auspices of World Business Chicago. We are also experienced major economic gains in direct access dealing with the restructuring of McCormick Place, which I talked about a little earlier. I want to thank uh, Speaker Madigan, Senator uh, President John Cullerton, House uh, Minority Leader uh, uh, Cross, Jim Riley for their hard work, and Senator Christine Redona for bipartisan efforts in rebuilding McCormick Place. I just want to thank their efforts in regards to all these uh, new jobs and to create new opportunities for people, conventions, and trade shows coming to the city of Chicago. And we can do that, and we can recruit more and more. What we all know, <laughs> but we all know that in Chicago, a strong economic future uh, it provides a succeed. Our workforce must be educated and skilled. That is the key, educated and skilled. Training our residents in remarkable skills for modern jobs is one of the most important ways we can support the people of Chicago in the years ahead. And towards that goal, we have transformed our education at every level here. From public schools, our workforce training programs, City College of Chicago, so we were better coordinated uh, all job training and education efforts. And we made our commitment to make Chicago the best school system in the country. And I'm very, very proud of that. But like anything else, we know what we can do. We know that uh, uh, the City Colleges is a key with the Board of Education. And I'm very, very proud of where the City Colleges are going. At the same time, we know that dealing with the Chicago Career Academy, which we've seen time and time again, that was a lost middle class of America, those who made America what it is today. They have been laid off because they do not have technology skills, many of them in our city. They have bought their homes, they pay for their taxes, and they have been forgotten by America. But I'll be very frank, Chicago did not forget the middle class. Our career tech is a six-month, six-day-a-week training program that features hands-on employer learning in partnership with the private sector. Two days of training, two days on-the-job skills, and two days of community service. And upon graduation, participants will have the skills they need to succeed in technology-based careers, including high-demand fields such as healthcare and telecommunications. And we have already scheduled five more classes through October of 2012, enrolling about 1,700 more adults in these programs. We have re reinvented our workforce development programs. And today, through our Workforce Investment Council, working with World Business Chicago, we are improving the way we invest more than $300 million in workforce development funds to ensure that every citizen who needs or wants to attain the skills of the future can do so. Through these new programs, which will bring skilled building opportunities directly to neighborhoods that need it the most here in our city. Even with these steps to create new opportunities, we must continue to update our neighborhood infrastructure. These investments improve, improve the quality of life, and they also create more and more jobs. We will soon announce the next phase of our capital improvement plan, through which we continue to make important neighborhood ward-by-ward -ward improvements here in the city of Chicago and we will continue to invest in new community anchors. In 2010, we, have opened a, we will open a new library, two new beach houses, the new Park District Field House, a new police station with more anchors scheduled to open next year. By the end of 2011, we have, op we have opened eight new schools, completed four major additions and four major renovations. And in 2011, we'll open three new libraries, one new firehouse, and another new field house. Even with these austere budget times, we keep investing in infrastructure in our communities, which are important. Not as much as I like or we need, but other cities have discontinued all their investments in infrastructure. We've made it a priority to move forward with all this. We're also working hard to end the digital divide. Last week, we announced over $21 million in new grant funds for a digital excellent plan through which under, underserved communities their small business and residents are being provided 
with 21st century technology. And at the same time, we will continue to improve our transportation infrastructure, which is essential to a modern economy and key to our success as a capital of the Midwest. And that's why completing O'Hare modernization plan is critical. When it's done, we expect it will create over 195,000 jobs, generate $18 billion in additional annual economic benefits, and will keep Midway strong and competitive as well. It's also we're moving forward with our CREATE program to improve freight rail infrastructure, which is vital to our regional and national economic success. And that's why we're pursuing high-speed rail for our region. We'll work both in Springfield and Washington to get more transit and infrastructure funding to build a much more efficient system. And most importantly, we will continue to improve our Chicago's public transportation system. The CTA is already working on a number of enhancements, including new upgraded stations, new rail cars, elimination of slow zones, track improvements, and security enhancements. The CTA will continue to seek federal support for planning expansion of rail lines to expand in geographical areas served by the L North, South, and Southwest. When it comes to our building stronger and affordable communities, we will continue to promote stability and economic opportunity and help those who need it the most. Through our Human Infrastructure Fund, supported by parking meter lease revenues, we will continue to fund after-school and housing programs. We'll also fund programs that address vulnerable populations, including our seniors and people with disabilities. We'll also continue to aggressively help homeowners stay in their homes and avoid foreclosure. And we will continue to build and press for affordable housing to spur economic development in underserved communities. Obviously, we'll continue to implement our groundbreaking plan for transformation of the Chicago Housing Authority to build stronger and mixed income neighborhoods throughout our city. This plan has already transformed the lives of thousands of people. Although the recession has slowed it down, we will get it done. With federal grants, we are implementing our neighborhood sta stabilization program to acquire vacant and foreclosed residential property so they can be returned to productive use and no longer blight communities or serve as magnets of crime. And we'll continue our fight for property tax reform and fairness in Springfield to keep all of our neighborhoods affordable. But much I have spoken about today can't happen unless we manage our city's resources well, put a priority on investments that support people and create new jobs. As you know, next year we're facing a budget deficit of $655 million. To get ahead of our budget deficit, we're consistently cut spending and taking steps to control costs. I'm leading by example. I'm taking a 20,000 pay cut. Sorry, Maggie. <laughs> In addition, this year, and at that point, I believe all government should do the same. I think all government should lead by example and stop giving speeches. People are suffering all the way down from the governor, the president, Congress, legislative branches should do the same thing. In addition, this year we cut non-personnel, non-safety spending across the board by another 6%, implemented many other cost-cutting efficiencies. We're working with vendors to reshape, reshape their contracts and cut their costs by 10%. In the last two and a half years, we cut nearly $400 million in spending. To help balance next year's budget, we will continue to improve the management of government, making departments consolidation so government works better for people. But as I said at the City Club a few weeks ago, we cannot balance the budget through better management and growing revenues alone. I can't rule out that to balance next year's budget, we forced to put many things on hold or reduce or cut some services permanently or for a year or two. But I can assure the taxpayers that should it come to this, it will be a last resort. I will move, uh, I will fully address our budget challenges in the next few weeks. Of course, we have to make sure that government is affordable for people. And that's why we will not raise property taxes in next year's budget. People are still hurting and will continue to hurt for a long time. We in government should not, we in government should not add the burden to taxpayers here 
in this, in this city, this state, and this country. We have been through a lot in Chicago and the nation over the last two years. And there's more to come. Our people have suffered, and we continue to suffer. But the people of Chicago are resilient. They're strong and forward-looking. And like me, have faith in the future. And you have to have faith in the future. The challenges we face are real. We cannot let them overwhelm us individually or collectively. I know if we work together uh, to unleash even more of Chicago's potential, then we move beyond the, the dark days of the recession and emerge much stronger. And I appeal to people, we all have to, to work together. We all have to take our responsibility. I firmly believe there are better days ahead and a brighter future and a greater opportunity for everyone lies ahead in Chicago because the sacrifice that our forefathers had made for this great city and this great country, and they sacrificed. I think America has to get back to sacrifice for one another and to help one another. Just like City Year, young men and women sacrificed for us, another generation saying that we want to help. In helping, Chicago can be better and we can help all. Thank you very much.